Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Carnegie Council uh, for Ethics and International Affairs book talk from the U.S. Global Engagement Program. Uh, I'm a senior fellow and your co-host for this evening, Nicholas Gvozdev, and my co-host Tatiana Serafin and I are very pleased to have with us this evening uh, Mr. Peter Martin, the defense policy and intelligence reporter for Bloomberg, based in Washington, D.C., uh, here to discuss his very timely work on China's civilian army, the making of wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, which uh, we've seen deployed especially uh, in regards to Australia. And Australia is back in the news for its uh, balancing with the United States and the United Kingdom, ostensibly uh, to counter uh, the growing rise and influence of China. So I'm sure that there are things that have been happening in the news, uh, which uh, uh, Peter will be able to uh, link the larger concepts uh, of his book. Uh, but uh, we invite you all this evening to this presentation and discussion to get a better understanding of this still very not well understood tool of soft and sharp power uh, that is deployed by China uh, to have influence and uh, to create pressures uh, in various target societies. So, Tatiana, if I turn it over to you to uh, give a sense for our audience of logistics and how we'll be taking their questions. And then after that, Peter, the floor will be yours. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Peter. Uh, I just want to show a copy of your book and all the notes that I took while I was reading it. Um, the book has a, is so readable. And, and I say that because sometimes uh, books with historical references um, you know, tend to be very heavy, but this is a book that everyone can read. And I encourage all of our audience here today um, to grab a copy if you haven't already. It, it really serves to give a context of where China has come from and why, why they are doing what they're doing today. And I think the why, Peter, is not often understood. And so hopefully um, our audience, you'll have questions for Peter. Um, I will be monitoring the chat and um, making sure that your voice is heard. Um, but right now we wanna hear Peter and tell us about how this book started. What, what gave you the idea? Where did it come from? Um, mm -hmm. I, I as, as a lover of books, always wanna know what, what was that spark? Yeah, well, thanks. Um, thanks so much for hosting me. Um, I'm uh, I'm really excited to do this. Um, so yeah, I I mean, I guess um, the idea from the book kind of kind of came when I, I moved back to Beijing with Bloomberg in uh, early 2017. Um, and I you know I'd been away for a few years, and um, you know was immediately struck by the the extraordinary economic and, and and military and kind of hard power progress that China had made during that time you know Xi Jinping was um promoting the Belt and Road Initiative overseas China had a new military base in Djibouti was uh militarizing its artificial islands in the South China Sea and and of course there was what appeared to be this opening with um the Trump administration um where you know President Trump was busy criticizing um, picking fights with US allies and uh, taking issue with international institutions and and there seemed to be this kind of void that was um, that was potentially there for Beijing to move into. And yet you know as I as I worked there as a political reporter that the, the, the longer that period went on, the clearer it became that for whatever reason Beijing wasn't capable of kind of stepping up, and filling that leadership void, um, especially when it came to the ability to kind of persuade others beyond using economic inducements or or coercion. Um, and if you you know when you when you step back and and think about the the kind of world that we're moving into, where U.S. power kind of slowly recedes from from the heights that we saw in the post Cold War era, and uh, you know that every country which has a claim to international leadership is going to need to rely on this ability to persuade others and I, I just became fascinated by you know why is it that Beijing struggles to do that so much and, and, and as I worked there in China I, I started to see Chinese diplomats in particular as kind of a microcosm um, of that problem you know because when you when you meet Chinese envoys they can be really charming and they're something they're funny they're sophisticated they speak 
Bahasa and Czech and some of them have studied at Georgetown and the London School of Economics and and uh, you know clearly it's not it's not a sort of human capital problem here that's that's holding China back and yet when they get up on stage in the foreign ministry or they sit down across the table from their counterparts they have this very uh, kind of stilted sometimes very ideological approach to engaging with people and they'll they'll rattle off the same official talking points kind of ad nauseum and and, and, and you start to wonder, you know, where does this approach come from? And so I, I decided that um, I'd start looking into, uh, you know, I knew there were a couple of memoirs out there by former foreign ministers and prominent people. So I looked into those and thought they were kind of interesting and did my best to start gathering, you know, doing interviews in Beijing. But but really, the, the more I looked into the memoirs, the, the, you know, I realized that there were more than 100 of these books um, most of which had never been used before, um, quite understandably, because they're horribly boring books. But, um, <laughs> but you know, kind of hidden uh, amongst uh, long, long discussions of, of meeting after meeting and flight after flight is uh, are these little details which kind of shed light on, on what it's like to be on the front line of, of Chinese diplomacy. And I started to think, well, you know, if I could put these together, there might be a book project in here. And, and when I started doing that four years ago now, um, it, this was a pretty niche topic. People weren't paying too much attention to Chinese diplomats. And, and just as, as time went on, this wolf warrior phenomenon um, really came to the fore and, and, and Chinese diplomats have been very much in the public spotlight. And of course, if you watched any of the confirmation hearings um, earlier this year on Capitol Hill, you'll have seen that Biden administration nominees have been talking about the rise of wolf warriors and uh, foreign governments have been discussing it. Intelligence agencies are, uh, are interested in it. Um, and, you know, we, we've seen a whole series of, of uh, events take place where Chinese diplomats have have spread conspiracy theories about the origins of COVID-19. They've stormed out of international meetings. They've told foreign politicians to shut up. Uh, and earlier this year, of course, China's top diplomat, Yang Jiechi, delivered a, a sort of 17 minute withering diatribe to um, Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. Um, but, you know, as I was researching this, this kind of behavior for the book, I guess the thing that really jumped out to me was this idea that while wolf warrior diplomacy seems very new on the surface, actually its roots go back a very, very long way. Um, so, you know, when the, the PRC was founded by Chairman Mao in, in 1949, uh, it, it basically had no diplomats to speak of. Um, there, there was a small group of nationalists, the former government diplomats who were who were left behind, and they were very much marginalized in favor of starting a foreign ministry, um, more or less from scratch. Um, and and the, the new government really faced kind of a paradoxical challenge because, you know, on the one hand, this was an extremely secretive, paranoid political regime, which was very suspicious of outside influence. And on the other hand, China had almost no friends or allies and needed to build bridges with the outside world in order to survive. And so China's first foreign minister or the PRC's first foreign minister, Zhou Enlai, came up with this idea that Chinese diplomats would, would think and act like the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. Um, and what he meant by that was that they would be unfailingly loyal to the Communist Party. They'd be disciplined to a fault and that they would display crucially what he described as a fighting spirit whenever China's interests were, were challenged. And of course, we've seen that fighting spirit on, you know, on clear display in recent years. And you know, as Joe laid down this ethos, there was, um, there were, there was a set of, of kind of quite distinctive behaviors that began to take shape. So Chinese diplomats, in order to Kind of keep themselves safe and on the right side of politics would stick closely to talking points even when they knew that those talking points didn't resonate with foreign audiences they would move around in pairs in order to keep tabs on each other um, when they felt challenged or they worried that they they looked insufficiently tough back home they might shout at foreign counterparts 
and, and they would elevate even the smallest of, of little incidents into kind of major international issues um, if, uh, if they were worried that they might appear disloyal. And this, these kinds of behaviors actually led to what we would now call displays of wolf warrior diplomacy right from the outset. So in 1950, uh, China dispatched a delegation to the United Nations led by this veteran revolutionary Wu Xiuquan who had like a, a bullet scar across his face. And, you know, he, he delivered this speech which Time Magazine described at the time as two awful hours of rasping vituperation. Um, and, you know, in, in, in succeeding decades, Chinese diplomats literally engaged in, in fistfights on the streets of London. They were pictured wielding axes, handing out copies of Chairman Mao's Little Red Book. They were expelled from countries around the world. Um, so, so those wolf warrior tactics have a long pedigree. But there's also this, this other tendency, which, uh, which has been prominent at other times. This what I kind of think of as the charm offensive persona of Chinese diplomacy. And, uh, you know, when China needs to build up um, friends and influence, it's capable of taking that extraordinary discipline that Zhou Enlai expected of his civilian army and, and putting it toward those more constructive ends. And we saw that happen in the 1950s as Beijing courted developing countries around the world. And we saw it happen most effectively in the 1990s in the aftermath of the Tiananmen massacre when Beijing uh, really managed quite an impressive turnaround of its international reputation, which ultimately, of course, culminated in its hosting the 2008 Summer Olympics. Um, so these, these two tendencies have kind of ebbed and flowed and gone back and forth over time. And what I think we've seen since 2008 is a real veer back toward the assertiveness and the, the kind of wolf warrior persona. And uh, I think that's been driven by two things. So uh, on, on the one hand, you have this kind of new confidence which is, which is felt quite broadly in, in Beijing, in political circles. And you also have these enduring insecurities which have followed the government right from the very outset. Um, and you know, when you think about um, China's political system, it's, it's become a, a, an increasingly scary place um, under Xi Jinping in particular. So you, you have um, this sweeping anti-corruption campaign, which he's initiated, which has punished more than 1.5 million officials. You have his abolition of presidential term limits, his experimentation with re-education camps in the west of China, um, and, and, and a focus on ideology at home. Um, and when, when Chinese diplomats see these signals, they know exactly how to interpret them. They know that in the past, when, when Chinese diplomats have got on the wrong side of the regime, they've ended up in quite severe um, trouble. And so what they've done, I think, is start to mimic the, the very um, uh, am ambitious way that Xi Jinping speaks about China's role in the world and his, his great confidence for the role that China ought to play and the, the degree of respect that it deserves. But they've also paired that with this need to respond to that constant sense of, 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 of threat and insecurity that um, is just part and parcel of working in the Chinese political system. Um, and so, so that, that new tone kind of started after 2008-9 intensified under Xi Jinping in 2012, and then really went into high gear during the, the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. And I think it's, it's that same thing, right, that drove it. It's this sense that, um, you know, on the one hand, China is being criticized from all sides for, uh, you know, allegedly covering up its role in the outbreak of the pandemic. And on the other hand, it managed to contain the outbreak much better than North American and Western European countries. And it, it kind of feels like, you know, why should I have to listen to this criticism um, when, you know, when I, I, I've been so much more able. And, and, and so that combination of those two things really set a new tone for Chinese diplomacy. And we've seen diplomats talking about China's central role in the world, um, the extraordinary leadership of Xi Jinping, handing out copies of Xi Jinping's book on governance, just like diplomats handed out Mao's Little Red Book um, decades ago. And, and I guess, uh, of all people, 
foreign ministry spokesman Jali Jin has kind of become the face of this new um, phenomenon. And so he, he was this relatively obscure figure who, who was based in, uh, in Islamabad and uh, picked a Twitter fight with former national security advisor, Susan Rice, and kind of rocketed yeah. to fame and was appointed China's foreign ministry spokesman. He, he has subsequently, you know, he, he angered the Trump administration by, by suggesting that the US army had deliberately started COVID-19 yeah. in, in Wuhan. Um, and, uh, you know, he, so he, he's kind of become the face of it in many ways, but he's, he's not alone. There are other figures, Gui Tong Yo in Sweden, um, China's ambassador there was was summoned by Sweden's foreign ministry 40 times in the space of two years. And he said in the media interview, um, you know, for our friends, we have fine wine and for our enemies, we have shotguns, um, which really gives you a taste of, uh, of the approach that he wants to take to diplomacy. And I guess I'd just finish by saying, like, not everyone in China's foreign policy establishment agrees with this approach. Um, some people would like to see it kind of pared back and 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 uh and tempered a little bit but uh but crucially Xi Jinping seems to like the approach and um to approve of the the tough new tone and uh you know at at the at the moment in Chinese politics what what Xi Jinping says goes and uh I don't see many chances for a recalibration in the short term so I guess I'll 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 leave the opening remarks there and just really look forward to to getting on with some some good questions Excellent. Um, I'll look through the chat, but you know we'll jump because we do have the UN um, happening, uh, the UN GA meetings happening in New York here this week. Um, we're here in uh, I'm in here in New York, Nixon, Rhode Island, um, but we're watching them very closely. And you know, Xi spoke. You know, we didn't know he would speak, right? There was this idea that there would be some sort of senior official, and then all of a sudden he comes on, and his speech seemed not very wolf warrior like. And I'm wondering what you th thought of his comments. You know, they seemed, you know, geared at multilateralism, dialogue, cooperation. Um, I mean, is this a, is this, I know you said in the short term, there won't be a change. So what do you think was behind that? And does it have anything to do, since you mentioned the 2008 Olympics, the 2022 Olympics in, in Beijing next year? Yeah, it's a great question. And and I, I guess that, um, you know, Chinese officials have have different personas sort of depending on the, the forum. So when when she spoke recently for the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party in Beijing, he gave this extraordinarily almost sort of blood curdling speech with all of these metaphors about what would happen to people if they messed with China. Uh, and that was very focused on a domestic audience. And, and when the audience is, is much more explicitly international, there's a sort of separate set of talking points which Xi Jinping has used at Davos and he uses frequently at forums like APEC and the UN where, where all of the focus is on win-win cooperation and uh, you know, global challenges and, and uh, focusing on, on the kind of constructive role that China wants to play um, internationally. And you know, I, it, it, in truth, both of those approaches have um, uh, have something going for them as a way to explain China's behavior. And what I think she was doing was um, using a set of talking points which were really quite successful in the early days of the Trump administration and, and kind of trying them out under Biden. So the, um, the, the, the tack from Chinese officials in, in recent weeks seems to have been uh, when it when it comes to U.S. China and when it comes to the U.S.'s place in the world, uh, you know things went very badly wrong under Trump. Uh, you caused a lot of problems. We are willing to work with you if you just atone for all of the mistakes you've made, and uh, you know welcome back to the table. And that that message hasn't gone down terribly well in Washington. Um, but but I think in Xi's speech you can kind of see an, an echo of that kind of approach, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to take a question from, from one of the panelists, um, which is related to something I was also looking at. Um, there was a recent um, New York Times article that said um, that Chinese are turning away from English and, and kind of getting more um, insular. So you, you spoke of you know, speaking to an, an audience internally. Yeah. And I'm wondering what you think about that. And our question comes from George Below. Um, At present, Western educated Chinese appear to have been brushed aside in the Xi administration. Um, 
do you agree with that? And, uh, and, or what are you seeing? And I, you know, I'm wondering if you saw the New York times article about English, because in your book, you talk so much about how, you know, th they did try to learn the languages, you know, up from the earliest days when they were sent to, you know, the Czech Republic and they didn't know a word of the Czech or a word of Polish that they really tried and they re relied on the Soviet union to kind of help them engage with the world. Um, and, and kind of, all, even the, in your conclusion, you speak with, with a diplomat, a new diplomat that, that is, you know, multi, has multi-language uh, skills. So how do you marry that with this idea that there, people are turning away from English and turning away from the, the West? Yeah, I mean, so that, that as, as, you, as you say, there's been this like long-term and ongoing tension between um, openness to the outside world and a desire to learn from it. And then also desire to protect China's political system and, and Chinese culture as well from, from outside influences. And, and that, that tension hasn't gone anywhere under Xi Jinping. It's still very much here. Um, I, I think that certain levels of foreign training are still very, very welcome in parts of the Chinese political system. When you think of China's financial regulators, um, lots of them are US educated. And I think there is a, there's a sort of recognition that that kind of um, expertise is very much needed in, in China. And that's, that's the same also with many of the Chinese graduate students who are sent overseas every year. And, uh, you know, of course, the, the Trump administration focused in on how um, some of those students um, have, have been used as a, a conduit for um, technology transfer um, and espionage, of course, uh, that doesn't apply to, to the vast majority of people, but, but you know, that's, that's an issue that's kind of come to the fore. Um, but, you know, when it, when it comes to the foreign ministry, I think um, there's really a, a sort of bigger problem um, with, with outside influence and, um, and studying overseas, which is that, that the foreign ministry really wants its officials to be loyal to the system above all. And um, fr from what I understand, it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible now, to join the foreign ministry if you have studied abroad for a master's or an undergraduate degree. Um, and that, you know, any kind of extensive foreign ties are increasingly problematic. What, what needs to happen if you want to make your way in that system is that you need to apply to join the foreign ministry and then they'll send you on a foreign exchange program or a, a a foreign language training oh. program. And, and when that happens, you know, I've spoken to Chinese diplomats who talk about how strictly now they, they, they use this buddy rule that I talked about earlier, even when students are studying overseas, even when they're in classes um, at foreign universities. And so it's, it's, it's a pretty high degree of control. And I think that reflects the very sensitive place that Chinese diplomats have in, in China's political system. Hmm. I, I liked your, well, I, I don't know if I liked it. I'll say I was fortified by your analogy to the handmaid's tale and uh, and how the women had to walk together. And um, because it does, it is a, a strict control, exactly what you're saying um, and talking about. And I'm wondering, you know, along those lines, you, you use this word uh, several times in the book. I don't know why I picked it up. I guess it's a very strong word. You talk about um, China being viewed as a pariah by the outside world and how that is very upsetting to them. Um, do, do you think that that's a driver of some of their policies? I mean, you know, uh, and if they're a pariah, do who's their friend today in twenty twenty one? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I do think that there's this very strong um, kind of animating um, desire to to be taken to be treated as a full member of the international system. And when we when we think about China now and the size of its economy, that seems like a slightly quaint desire, you know, because because clearly in so many ways the PRC has has very much arrived, and um, and there's no questioning that. And and yet. Um, when it comes to issues like universal human rights or China's political system, I think that Chinese officials still feel very much on the back foot, um, as if the assumption, uh, the, you know, the, the, the sort of fundamental assumptions about the way that the world works is that uh, systems will be based on democracy and that countries are on a trajectory toward that end, uh, even if they haven't finished the journey yet. Chinese officials have been challenging that notion quite publicly in, in recent years um, and, and, and kind of touting a, 
a, a China model as an alternative, but but there is this still very strong desire to to achieve recognition. And, and if you saw headlines in recent days about the World Bank's ease of doing business index and, and China's attempts to influence that ranking, I think that's that's kind of a that's kind of a nice small example of how something that is relatively insignificant. You know, if you're 72 versus 68 on that ranking, it's not going to move the bar very much for, for foreign observers, but it's a it's a stamp of international legitimacy that, that the government in Beijing still wants quite badly. Um, and then, you know, on, on the related question of, of who are China's friends, I think um, you, you, you can sort of, you know, China doesn't really have formal allies in the same way that that the US does. It has a couple of very, very close relationships, notably uh, uh, by treaty with North Korea, then, uh, you know, an incredibly strong relationship with Pakistan, uh, kind of similarly close ties with Cambodia. And, and beyond that, it's much more of a sort of mixed picture. Uh, China is very capable of using economic inducements to win influence in in Africa and, and parts of Latin America. And it's really struggled, I think, in the last few years to, to win over genuine friends in the West. And in many ways, Wolf Warrior Diplomacy has made that challenge even more difficult. That's actually, a you led right into the question and, and comment that I would like to bring up, which precisely is this point of utility. Uh, several years ago, as you noted, that China was making uh, enormous strides, first of all, uh, in pointing to the, you know, its ability to be a, a partner, its ability to help, that it would step in to kind of keep the international system running. Uh, and it seems that in many places, this, this shift back to a more in-your-face, aggressive tone reinforces what a lot of people were saying, which is, well, this is, this is the true face, right? The, the friendly China was a ruse trying to lull us, but this is, this is who the PRC really is. And if they were to, to, to gain more uh, influence in the international system than, than they already have, this is, this is what you would see. I mean, is there a sense that uh, this uh, allowing this campaign uh, to continue is going to be counterproductive, or is it a sense that the places where wolf warrior diplomacy is is most used are societies and countries where uh, Beijing figures it, it has nothing to lose? Yeah, I mean, I th I think that's that's a great question, which in many ways kind of. Uh, it does, it does a very nice job of contextualizing why wolf warrior diplomacy matters. So, um, you know, it's, it's very clear if you look at the, 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 the range of policies pursued by Xi Jinping since he came into office, um, wolf warrior diplomacy is just one part of the picture. And, you know, for, foreign audiences have been upset by China's drive to pursue... Um, Know, very very aggressive industrial policies through made in china 2025 um militarize the south china sea crackdowns in xinjiang and hong kong uh the abolition of presidential term limits all of these things and, and many more have, have have alienated foreign audiences and and sat very very uneasily alongside these kind of speeches that we discussed earlier where china would talk about win-win cooperation and shared interests and a community of shared destiny and all of these kinds of things and it was it was quite difficult to square that behavior with that rhetoric and what, what i think wolf warrior diplomacy has done is that it it's it's come along as part of that broader package of, of kind of creeping assertiveness from beijing and it's crystallized the perception that china is a threat and is is problematic and and, and in many ways sort of put a human face on it um, and it's, it's going to be pretty difficult, I think, to walk that perception back in the coming years, if that's something that Beijing chooses to do. Yeah, I think it, I saw a new study come out today, or the, it was a Guardian, it was a Guardian poll that showed that the EU um, citizens believe that there's a new Cold War between the US and China and Russia. Um, what what is the relationship between China and Russia today? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, in your book, you detail the historic relationships, um, the, the strength of it, and then how it fell apart. Um, where are we today? And and is to you know, what are your perceptions of this idea of a Cold War between the U.S. and China and Russia? Um, 
yeah i mean so i'm i'm no expert on china russia ties i but i think that um you know in in general the the two sides have have become radically closer after the end of the cold war and kind of share this sense that um the us led international system is unfair and is is aimed at um preventing them from from realizing their full potential um internationally and they also share this very strong sense of resentment about the the hand that they've been dealt by history um and the role that western powers have have played in that um there is this of course great imbalance in the relationship right when when you look at their economies china is a rising power and russia is a declining power um and their their general sort of risk tolerance in the international system is also a little bit different you know i think china and its leaders realized that um by by kind of allowing present trends to continue they will end up benefiting and play a, a more central role and, and russia's leaders realized that if current trends continue to play out in terms of economic influence and power their role will diminish and they need to take provocative and uh you know actions in the meantime whether that's electoral interference or or action on russia's borders in order to kind of stem that decline so there are some real differences there and i think over time that is driving this kind of fear of dependency a little bit in 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 russia when it comes to um beijing and so many people have predicted for a long time that that kind of china russia friendship would would start to fray and i think you know a lot of observers have been uh, quite startled in in recent years as that that degree of cooperation has only deepened um and it's 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 gone beyond that kind of ad hoc um cooperation which which many had see, had uh, had seen playing out before um you know, i i don't know i don't know how long that will last but uh there seems to be no sort of short term reason to expect that it will be upended anytime soon and that and that i think coming back about maybe that is there is there a, a, a barometer that wolf warrior diplomatic tactics perhaps gives us uh, because when you were talking about the China Russia relationship uh, not I'm not an expert on it either but what I follow in it and what seems to be very striking uh, compared to these techniques used elsewhere is the extent to which they're not used in Russia uh, against Russia right there isn't this uh, and that Xi Jinping has taken steps in the past to kind of cut down on uh, the traditional negative stereotypes of Russians that you would find in Chinese media and, and uh, you know, uh, film and television. There's almost a sense there of, of wanting to cultivate. And we see this, I think, in some parts of Eastern Europe still, uh, Central and East Europe, where there's still a Chinese effort. Uh, I mean, they lost Lithuania, so it's now the 16 plus one. Uh, but is there a sense or do you have a sense that, uh, you know, these tactics are more likely to be used uh, when the relationship, or you, I guess it's the chicken and egg question, right? Is is the relationship worse in for, for first and then we see wolf warrior come out in force, the teeth of the wolf come out, or does China use these tactics and then the relationship worsens? Uh, how does that work itself out? Uh and as you said before, how much of this is independently done and, how, you know, someone taking the lead from the speeches uh, of Xi Jinping and others, and how much of it do you think uh, is, is, is tightly scripted or directed from, from the foreign ministry? Yeah, uh, there's a lot there and they're all big questions. So I think um, in, in terms of when wolf warrior tactics are used, there are sort of a couple of ways to to break it down um and as you said when when the relationships are warmer um and closer they they tend to be employed less frequently so you there's there's not been very much in the way of wolf warrior diplomacy in africa and yeah. and when envoys have made kind of very uh, provocative statements they've often tended to actually be about the u.s leadership rather than um than local political elites um, and certainly there's been less of it in Russia as well. There's been a few sort of isolated incidents, but but on the whole, the, the tone has been much more positive. And so I think it's it's certainly true that uh, these kinds of tactics um, tend to, to go alongside 
other measures which are at Beijing's disposal, right? Whether that is unilateral economic sanctions or whether it's state media campaigns against, against these governments um, and the displeasure of, of China's top leaders, all of those things tend to get wrapped up with, with, with world warrior diplomacy as kind of a package. Um, I think this, this, the second really important determinant actually is, is the power of countries that, that Beijing is dealing with. Um, and you know, to talk to people in, in Washington, you would think that the US had borne the brunt of, of world warrior diplomacy. And in fact, it's not, it's not yes. true at all. Um, <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a far more scarring experience for countries like France, Australia, Britain. Um, and I, I think that the reason for that, uh, Ca- you know, Canada as well, the reason for that is that, that Beijing realizes that the consequences of upsetting these countries are just much smaller. And so, you know, on the one hand, Wolf Warrior Diplomacy is kind of a useful pressure tactic to try and force these countries to get back into line. And, and also it's a useful stage for ambitious Chinese officials who want to get promoted and noticed back home and, and can do so and engage in these antics without the risk of really upsetting China's foreign policy. And, and the, the tone with the US, despite a few important and high profile instances has actually been much, much more measured. And I think I think we see that from the way that uh, China's new ambassador in Washington, Qin Gang, has conducted himself. There have been some provocative statements, but but most of the tone, most of the time has been about working together and deepening ties and welcoming cooperation. And, and I think that just reflects the reality of, of, of how powerful the US is and, and the extent to which the Chinese still um, respect that. Um, just, just on that question you raised of, of how much is independent versus how much is kind of ad-libbed on the ground, it's a mixture. Um, the, the, the general tone of Wolf Warrior diplomacy, this idea that China shouldn't need to apologize for its system, shouldn't tolerate any kind of bullying or interference in its internal affairs or any unwarranted, what's perceived to be unwarranted criticism of China. That that comes straight from the top. That comes from Xi Jinping. And, you know, he he has been talking about that way in public, uh, in that way in public since at least 2008, before he became China's president. And, um, you know, I, I think you can see that that general approach kind of reverberate through the whole of the Chinese bureaucracy, not just the the foreign ministry, but also the propaganda apparatus and the United Front apparatus and and, and much, much more. Um, Where I think there's quite a lot of ad living is when it comes to tactics and especially tactics on social media. Um, So the engagement of Chinese diplomats on Twitter is in relative terms, a very, very new phenomenon. The Chinese foreign ministry was slower than other parts of the Chinese bureaucracy to adopt Twitter as a platform. The State Council Information Office and state media did it much earlier. And uh, Chinese envoys have, have kind of been able to use that platform as a way, I think, to kind of perform um, for Beijing. Um, e- oh. e- even though Twitter is a banned platform in China, <laughs> when, awesome. when they can show um, you know, because this stuff gets reported back through diplomatic cables and it gets reported in Chinese state media. And if they can show that they are engaging with Western elites in a confident, forthright way that lives up to the expectations that Xi Jinping has of, of China's status internationally, then they're winning points for themselves and, and they're winning points for China at the same time. And so I think on, on that level of things, there's quite a lot of ad-libbing and, and uh, improvisation that happens. I love, I love that social media angle. And I want to remind our audience, um, send in your questions. Um, we're in the second half of our talk and I want to make sure that we get to all of your questions. So um, please continue sending send in your questions. Um, social media, um, I love social media. Um, uh, tell me, um, I, I, in your conclusion, I, I'm going to go back to, because, you know, the younger generation tends to use social media. That's just a fact, right? And how, and you, when you were speaking to, um, what, and his name, Wang Li, um, it, you were talking about how he questioned you about Tiananmen. And I, I would like for you to share that story with our audience, because I think it drives yeah. to this point of, what is the younger generation thinking? What do they know? Hey, Twitter is banned, Facebook is banned. You know, is, is this 
idea that information isn't getting to them or they're not, you know, this not having access, changing the way that this next generation is growing up in China versus how the rest of the world is growing up with an open internet. I can see everything I want anytime I want. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, so yeah, this, this, is, this is an anecdote from the, the conclusion of the book, which is a, a meeting I had with a, a, a very young um, Chinese foreign ministry official in Beijing. And uh, Wang Li is a, is a pseudonym that I, I gave him because uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to get anyone in trouble. But um, I, I met with this, this young official in, um, in a Starbucks and there was kind of jazz playing in the background. And it was all, it was all very relaxed and... Um, you know, he, he, he shouldn't have met with me. This um, is, Chinese diplomats are not allowed to meet with foreigners <laughs> on their own. And um, certainly, you know, this person just about to head overseas shouldn't have done it. And so I was, I was quite curious about how that had, had happened. And uh, we sort of talked about life and family and all, all, all the, you know, the weather and all the regular things you might get into with, with someone. And, eventually it sort of became clear that there was a, a, a motive on his part for, for having this conversation. And, and what he wanted to know was, was it true that the US had organized and instigated the student protests in Tiananmen Square in 1989? Um, and I was, I was a little taken back by that because um, it, it, it's one of those things that like, you you don't have to challenge very directly if you're a, 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 a Western participant in these conversations because you kind of know that uh, you know there's no way that any of our governments would have been able to pull off something so big and keep it secret for so long um, <laughs> that you don't need to challenge it. But in, anyway, he asked the question, and I I did my best to to answer, and and I, I it sort of struck home for me that. This wasn't a matter of, this person was very well read, um, used a VPN to get over China's great firewall, um, you know, had no shortage of facts about the, the events before and after Tiananmen. What, what he lacked was, a, a, and what, you know, frankly, we, we've seen this happen in our own societies as well, with Brexit and 2016 election and, and all kinds of things. But what he lacked was a framework for, evaluating those facts and, and, and um, a, a, a yardstick for deciding what was credible and what wasn't credible. And, and that struck me as a, as a pretty remarkable thing that, you know, you, you could have these officials going out into the world who were in so many technical ways, uh, incredibly adept and incredibly well versed, but uh, kind of didn't, didn't have a measure for evaluating truth um, from their own political system um and it, you know it, it, you sort of think about it and it's like well if 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 the chinese government can't persuade him of its narrative on tiananmen how on earth is it going to persuade the rest of us about its narrative for its place in the world and so that that was that was a, a kind of really striking moment for me that that kind of said something about the system yeah um what are you seeing so so he's an example of you know maybe a young millennial gen z what are, you know, when you were there, how are they engaging with the world? You know, you mentioned that he was able to jump the system. I mean, is, does that happen yeah. often, um, you know, or, or is it closed off? And I think for us here in the U.S., it's, it's kind of inconceivable, you know, or, you know, for my students to think that they wouldn't have access to anything they wanted um, every second of every single day. Um, so I'm wondering, like, you know, how, how does, how do youth in China engage with the system and, and how do they perceive all of these international relationships? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, as I, I don't know how many young people there are in, in, in China, but it's, I'm sure it's the, you know, it's a demographic the size of multiple Western European countries added together. So this is a huge group. Um, for urban groups, um, and you know, highly educated um, sort of strata of, of, of youth in China. I think that um, the question is less often kind of can you get the information you want. If you want to get it, you'll you'll find a way. You can you can get access to a uh, a book that you need, or 
software to, to get you the information. It's, it's more a case of, of being uh, siloed off from it by just, um, you know, gr growing up with state media repeating narrative after narrative and, and then um, watching events take place in the world, whether it's, um, you know, Donald Trump's trade war or, or whatever it is. And, and, and these, these kind of events that seem to um, confirm what you've been told from a very young age about how the world is, is intent on, on keeping China down. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I have a sort of sweeping one size fits all answer for that, but, but I, I guess uh, the party state has been very successful at using an information environment where it has quite a high degree of control over what people consume, taking real facts from the real world and using those to shape people's perceptions and, and maintain its own control. Interesting. Um, we have a couple questions coming in, so I want to make sure I take them. One of them um, the, deals with, from Rafael Moreto, with how does the foreign establishment um, re respond and work with the military establishment, you know, or, you know and, and how does Wolf Warrior Diplomacy then support what the military is trying to do? Yeah, so early on in, in the PRC, um, the, the kind of ties between the military and Chinese diplomats were incredibly robust. And many of China's early ambassadors um, were actually former PLA generals. Um, and as, as the decades wore on, those kinds of personal ties broke down and China started to appoint, uh, you know, officials who had risen up through the foreign ministry system as it's... Um, as its leadership, um, what I think is has kind of and 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 actually like the ability of the foreign ministry, which reports through the Chinese government system, to interact with the military, which reports directly to the Communist Party, is is very limited. Um, so that that kind of interagency process, which which people in Washington would be very familiar with seeing, is in, is incredibly hard to pull off inside China. Um, these bureaucracies are very distrustful of each other and and find it hard to communicate unless that you know, people sometimes call the system say the system is stovepiped, right? Because the information needs to flow upwards before it can flow across and back down. Um, so, so in general, I would say that that is the um, that's the kind of picture when it comes to to the military and the foreign ministry interacting. Um, but what what I do think has endured of those those kind of early ties is this ethos, right? This idea that the foreign ministry needs to act like the PLA and in civilian clothing, and it's interesting because Chinese officials um, almost, if you Google that phrase in English, um, you you know. Chinese foreign minister officials almost never refer to that legacy. If you Google the phrase in Chinese, Wen Zhangjie function, you'll find dozens and dozens of references and you'll see that current foreign minister Wang Yi has spoken about it on many occasions to, to young Chinese diplomats. The foreign ministry spokesperson Hua Chunying talked about it during a tour of, of the new military museum in, in Beijing. Um, so it's really one of those things that's kind of held back a little bit from from foreign audiences, but that that ethos I think is very much alive and is is still quite instructive when we think about wolf warriors. Um, we have a question coming in um, about the wolf warrior diplomacy with uh, China, the U.S., and North Korea. Um, and so, can you comment? Oh, you mentioned that North Korea is one of China's allies, if we use that word, or partners, or strong relationships. Um, how does the China then react to U.S. North Korea relations? Um, I think that uh, you know, North Korea for China is is it's kind of a thorn in its side, and it's a um, a card to be played. It's kind of both of those things at the same time. Um, China wants to see stability on the Korean Peninsula. It desperately wants to avoid a regime collapse there, which would have all kinds of uh, difficult consequences for Northeast China, which is already quite a uh, underdeveloped part of the country. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the de constant demand from the, the US that, that China should rein in it North Korea's nuclear ambitions has, has kind of been a real pain over the years for Chinese officials to deal with. At the same time, uh, this has been true 
many times over. It was true in the Bush administration. It was true under Obama and it was true under Trump and now under Biden. Um, that also provides Beijing with some source of leverage, right? Like if you, if you continue to um, uh, damage our relationship and to allow ties to deteriorate, we won't help you out with North Korea. And so there's, there's kind of a, there's a bit of a, um, a card there for China to play, but it's, it's a, it's a very tricky balance. And uh, uh, I think that um, Chinese officials really find it quite vexing and tiring to deal with, um, with the North Koreans. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I've seen this comment now a couple of times in the chat, Wolf Warrior Diplomacy seems to ensure that trust will never happen. And isn't the point of diplomacy to create trust? It's a, it's a great point. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really crucial, actually, because, you know, the, 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 when I talk to US practitioners of diplomacy, they, they talk about it as this kind of performance art where you take a relatively well defined set of talking points from your own side and you look at the person who's who's sitting opposite you in the room and you think about everything that your career has taught you about that person's culture and history and the the intangible mood in the room and and everything that that might need to be massaged and finessed in order to make that talking point your government has given you persuasive and it's it's an, it's a really incredibly difficult skill um and uh something that takes decades to to master and pull off and and chinese diplomats when it comes to um ability and, and education and skill i think are up there with most people but they have this this incredible handicap which is that they constantly have to think about how their messaging is going to be judged in beijing and if they deviate too far from uh you know, talking points that Xi Jinping has delivered, will that suggest that they're not loyal enough to Xi or not loyal enough to the Communist Party? And, and that, that kind of constant need to look over their shoulders, I think, um, hampers their ability to be persuasive and it really hampers their ability to win trust. Um, so there's that, that kind of talking points thing. And, and there's also this, this this real struggle that they have with building truly close personal relationships. And it's, it's, it's a strange thing because if you, if you spend much time in Beijing, you'll be constantly told by people, you know, oh, you're an old friend and we've known each other for years and, and whatever, but, but your, your personal relationship with these people really is very, very mediated by the party state. And, you know, I, I talked to us and European officials who spent decades dealing with Chinese interlocutors and couldn't name a single you know, true friend from Chinese officialdom um, at that time. And I think that does make it, it makes it hard to persuade and it makes it hard to win trust. Um, I, I want to um, talk and ask you if you saw the New Yorker article about um, the rise of made in China diplomacy and how the made in China diplomacy um, relates to wolf warrior diplomacy. So that would be the, um, you know, are the US's constant need for more and more goods from China, right? And so there's this, oh, okay, maybe we're gonna posture against each other, or you know, maybe we're gonna be friends for the Olympics, but really at the, at the end of the day, the bottom line is I buy a lot of stuff from you, <laughs> I need you. Um, and, and that's really the bottom line of it. And, and maybe that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, so I, I really like this, what do you think of this idea of made in China diplomacy? Yeah. Um... I, th I think that it's something that is not discussed actually enough when, when people are thinking about whether there is a, there's a new Cold War between China and the US and China and the West. Um, the, the, the relationship between the US and China is so much more complicated and interdependent than the relationship ever was between the US and the Soviet Union. And, and that just makes it infinitely more complicated to to kind of think about the world being split between these two superpowers and i think that you know and, and a big part of that of course is this um this huge economic interdependence and and the the reliance on each country's of each country's consumer economy on the others uh that that gets even more complicated when you put it in the context of of alliances and relationships and you can you can kind of see it playing out 
now a little bit, right? Like we, we're not watching the world split into two implacable blocks, one uh, opposed to Beijing and one in favor. What we're seeing is the Biden administration trying its very hardest to create ad hoc groups around ad hoc issues where it can it can win people over. So it's going, it's casting the net quite wide when it comes to this idea of a digital trade agreement in, in Asia. And the net is very, very narrow when it comes to um, sharing nuclear submarine technology with Australia and the UK. That grouping is, is much, much smaller. And there are other groups, whether it's the, the quad grouping of the US, India, Australia, and Japan, whether it's uh, you know, US uh, NATO cooperation, US EU cooperation, the Five Eyes Intelligence Group, all of these kind of varied and fragmented groups um, have a different stance on, on how to deal with Beijing, have some issues where they'd like to work with Washington and, and other issues where, frankly, that degree of interdependence and, and that, um, that reliance on made in China um, really undoes the ability to put together blocks. And so I think that's it's tremendously important when we think about the way that the world is shaping up. Um, absolutely. Um, we're, we're coming to uh, the end of our talk, and I could talk to you forever about this because I really love this book. So I want to just remind everyone, uh, the book is China's Civilian Army, The Making of Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. Uh, excuse all my blue tabs, but um, I wanted to, to highlight so much um, that I didn't get to. Um, there's so many great anecdotes here, so much great research that you've done. Um, can I just read one scene? Will you allow me to read this one scene? Please. It was uh, in 1969, you were describing how uh, the Chinese, and to your point throughout this talk, you said the Chinese diplomats don't want to engage with people and are very wary. So the unlikely moment for a breakthrough was a December 1969 Yugoslavian fashion show in Warsaw. A group of Chinese diplomats from the embassy in Poland attended the event led by Atase Jing Jisheng. They saw two Americans pointing at them across the room, unaware of the strategic rethink taking place in Beijing and hoping to avoid the appearance of being too close to Nixon's America, they stood up to leave. To their surprise, the Americans pursued them, shouting in Polish that Nixon wanted to resume talks with China. Jing and his associates began to run, but the ambassador to Poland, Walter Stossel, caught up with Jing's interpreter, telling him that he had an important message for the embassy. I think that scene exemplifies so much of what you've been talking about. What, what was your favorite scene in the book or, or something poignant to you as we round out our talk? Yeah, I, for, for me, the, 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 the part that really stuck in my head was in the early 1980s, um, actually Xi Jinping's first father-in-law from his, his marriage that, that, that didn't work out, um, who was sent to England to Margaret Thatcher's Britain as, as ambassador. And uh, I spoke with British officials who, um, who had, had met him during that period. And they said that the talking points that he delivered were very much in line with what the government expected. They were stilted. He was very controlled in the way that he expressed himself. And you would expect no less of a, of a professional Chinese diplomat. When you read, his name is Ke Hua, And when you read his, his memoir, you realize that he was undergoing this kind of profound crisis of confidence in, in China's socialist system. And he had come to the realization and the understanding that China needed to pursue aggressive economic reforms and that everything he had been taught as a young man about uh, the idea that Britain's class system would eventually be overthrown through violent revolution and that the workers were gonna stand up to the government and that the government didn't look after its people was unfounded. And he found, he found that out when his kid got sick and the British National Health Service looked after the child for free. Um, and so I, I, you know, I think especially when we see um, Wolf Warrior tactics playing out across the world, um, it's very easy to, to think of the, the people who are delivering these points as these monolithic representatives of the huge yeah. uh, faceless Chinese state. But actually, um, there's a lot of subtlety and acumen that goes into the way that they um, perceive the world and uh, the um, the profundity in the the, the way that they the, the way that they do that is not necessarily represented on the surface and so I guess that's that's the anecdote that sticks out for me 
Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for uh, comments. Um, uh, we're gonna save them and um, share them with Peter so that he sees everyone's comments. Um, Peter, thank you so much for your time and for joining us today at Carnegie Council. This was so much fun. Yeah, likewise, thank you. <laughs>